Hello there. My name's Brandon and I make pictures out of tiny squares. And today I want to make some pixel art based off of one of my favorite films of all time, Blade Runner. This movie really crystallized the look of the cyberpunk genre, and to this day it retains some of the most beautiful details and practical effects ever put to film. With such a unique world, one might expect several notable video game representations have been made, and there are three that I know of. Uh, there's a 1985 home computer game that didn't quite secure the film license and is thus quoted as being based off the soundtrack of the film. Uh, there's a 1997 point and click adventure game that's sort of a side story within the world. And then there's a RPG style mobile game that looks to have been released uh, in 2021. What I want to do today though is interpret a piece of Blade Runner into an arcade game. And I've been particularly inspired by a vertically scrolling run and gun shooter game called Ninja Commando first released for the Neo Geo in 1992. I think the top-down perspective here is a great vantage point for the world of Blade Runner, since it'll allow us to capture the look of the rooftops flanking the center street-level view. With a canvas size of 304 by 224 pixels, this sort of templating provides a nice form factor to create nicely sized character sprites, strong rendering for the environment, and a HUD bar that can be decorated up using stylistic choices from the movie. Rather than translating any one particular scene, I want to capture a general tone of the film within a single screenshot. Uh, perhaps one of the more action-packed sequences is the chase scene through the streets of neon-soaked Los Angeles, which ultimately ends in a confrontation with Leon. However, another iconic element of the movie is of course the Bradbury building, which Deckard ends up at shortly thereafter. So I'm going to play off these moments and locations and try to spin them up into one image. To get started, I measured out a space of 32 by 40 pixels to create my sprite for Deckard. Rather than using my typical workflow of starting from a stick figure to define the character pose, I actually just sort of blotted out a silhouette on this one. Last week after I made that stick figure video, I had a nice chat with our good pal Saltoons, a fellow pixel artist and fellow YouTube guy, uh, check him out if you haven't. And we were talking about ways to approach the creation of a character sprite, uh, where he tends to use the blob silhouettes and continually refine the shaping uh, before refining the character details. So fresh off that discussion, I thought I'd give it a shot for this one. And I think it turned out to be a good approach for this perspective, since we need to account for a bit of that overhead view distortion. So I tried to imagine the character within that silhouette uh, while continuing to shape it and carve in the details. I felt like I kept wanting a bit more clarity out of the line work, and eventually I bumped that bounding box out to a height of 48 pixels, uh, which helped give just a bit more room to work the coat the way that I wanted. So at this phase, I'm working with the sprite line work to find the main structure. Uh, the final sprite won't retain all this black line work, some of it will become colored outlines, uh, some will work into the shading. But the important thing is that underneath all those colors and shading is a sprite that's readable even when reduced to a simple representation like the dark line work within it. Now, regular viewers may recall that about a month and a half ago, I had actually already made a Deckard sprite uh, in more of a side-scroller style. And my intention at that time was that I was gonna parlay that into a full Blade Runner mock-up. Uh, but when I was sitting down to consider the play style of what this game might be, I really locked into this idea of the vertical scroller. Even seeing this sprite come together here, there's something really dramatic about this angle on the character that feels really well suited to this noir element that we're going for. And besides, I don't really mind having extra Deckard sprites on hand anyway. With the shading on this sprite, I've just been eyeballing and selecting colors on the fly using the HSB slider. And admittedly, grabbing colors out of thin air like this, uh, you know, you're likely to just get it wrong, <laughs> but I find that it helps to at least just have something on the board that can be tweaked later. Just seeing some kind of color on the screen will give you something that you can apply your opinion to, and then you can kind of shift it around from there. And so when I'm thinking about this arcade style, uh, I often lean towards the idea about a higher level of rendering and strong saturation and strong contrast. So for me, this translates into using several steps of color, uh, maybe about four or five levels for some of the main color groups, like the browns on his coat. This provides a fine level of control for drawing attention and playing with shadow. Like here, I was trying to draw focus to the arms uh, with the highlights, while having something like the arch or the back kind of tuck away into shadow. So just to recap here, uh, it's kind of funny seeing the growth of that initial blob that got carved out into the first version of the line work. Um, it's actually really kind of unrecognizable, uh, but sometimes you just need that starting point to get yourself going. And from there, I really pushed it up to occupy the entire bounds of the new 48 pixel height, 
uh, along with increasing the brightness, the contrast, and the saturation of just my random color selections to yield what I have in my mind as more of an arcadey type of look in the final sprite. So I centered the bounding box of the Deckard sprite on my canvas according to a grid of 8x8 pixel size tiles. A lot of the construction of this drawing was made using this tile sizing in mind, and it provides a nice way to plan out the sizing and alignment of various elements here. The HUD bar is allocated a space of 5 tiles high, or 40 pixels, and runs along the full length of the canvas. The individual small letters within there will occupy a single tile each, and then for the larger uh, press start lettering for player 2, I uh, blocked out an approximate space to work that within as well. For the life bar and timer, I'm creating a font that loosely resembles uh, kind of what's broadly referred to as magnetic ink character recognition <laughs> kind of font, uh, like you might find at the bottom of checks or something like that, where the characters have these sort of uh, little tab details on them. I'm going for the styling not only because it's a very sci-fi look, uh, but also it's inspired by the pixely lettering that can be seen on the side of the police spinner in Blade Runner. Going off that idea, I finished it in a blue coloring with a darker glow around the letters uh, to resemble what might be seen as lettering within the dashboard displays inside one of those cars. The press start lettering is sort of my best attempt at capturing the Gaudi old style font, and that's the one you see during the opening text of the film. And by the way, I've got to give due credit to the book Typeset in the Future, uh, which I picked up a while ago and it breaks down all the various fonts and custom typography used in a bunch of science fiction films. There's of course an entire chapter dedicated to all the different lettering used in Blade Runner and the design choices behind those, so this book became a really cool reference for me on this project. Going along with this idea of the opening text, I've done the credits lettering in the red color accent like we see in that text of the film. And it's kind of its own interpretation of the Gaudi font. Um, you know, at a lower resolution like this, it loses a bunch of that unique recognizability of that font. But it still ends up as kind of a neat looking pixel serif font in its own right. In order to fine tune the curvatures of the larger lettering, I've gone through and applied some manual anti-aliasing using a 50% gray color. This allows you to create a bit more curvature and tapering, especially in a lower resolution like this. So when you look at it from a distance, it'll hopefully appear a little bit closer to how the actual font should look. And it helps kind of soften those edges of the pure white on the pure black background. To create the little portrait of Deckard, I start from a circle and then move it into more of a head shape. And then I find the placement of the main features like the eyes, the mouth, and the ears. The workable space here within the bordering is only about 20 by 20 pixels so it can be a bit tough to capture the character likeness, uh, but still I've got my reference picture of Harrison Ford there just to have something to work from and compare to. I wanted to make sure to get the coat in there since it's such a defining character feature, but the main bulk of the portrait work was continuing to build in these steps of color to see what ways I could push some depth and detail out of this small space. What helped the most was using the shade tones to round out and fade the sides of the head and also using these tones within the face as a bit of line work to define features like the nose. And then on top of that, there's a bright tone used to highlight the cheeks, uh, the tip of the nose, and the chin. You can also see that I'd started keeping track of the colors that have already been placed down in the drawing, so we've actually got a bit of a palette forming now. And so for the portrait, I'm using the same colors that appeared on the character sprite. All right, for the main structure of the environment design, I'm starting by framing out the sidewalk and having each slab of sidewalk occupy a space of three by five tiles. These are positioned six tiles away from the edge of the canvas uh, because I figured that'd be enough space for the buildings. And then there's still a good amount of space remaining for the road in the middle also. To get the sidewalk tile started, I'm trying to find a blue gray color, uh, something that has sort of a cold but neutral look to it. And then I wanted to work out what the full gradient of color steps would be for that material. Again, I've gone for about four shades of blue-gray, uh, plus the initial black line work, and I'm using it to apply this shading along the front of the tile. I figured from our vantage point at this top-down angle, it would make sense to highlight this front edge of the tile in order to get the most noticeable and readable look from it. I've added a bit of speckle texture using one step in either direction from that main mid-tone color, 
And then I took this idea over into the road design also. Now the streets of Blade Runner have a dark and grimy feel to them. So it's important to get a lot of weathering in there. Um, I created a bunch of trash and debris along the road and also started introducing a few other colors in there, uh, like blues and low saturation greens and purples to kind of act as different types of puddles or stains and overall just provide more interest and color in the design in a subtle way. Another iconic element in the streets are these very unique looking parking meters. So I pulled up this reference image and then I'm trying to translate this thing into a top-down appearance while still maintaining the recognizability of the main features. Starting from essentially a simple rectangular block, I'm sort of carving away at this line work while placing items down like the glowing lights and you know the different angles that we can see. In general, I'm using light shades on the top faces and then one or two steps darker along the side. Uh, the main colors here are those found on the Deckard Sprite, just because I wanted these items to kind of pop out and look like they could be interacted with. Uh, you know, probably within the logic of an arcade game, you'd be able to shoot and destroy these things and get some kind of health pickup or something like a full roast chicken, uh, or maybe a bowl of noodles in this case. Over on the other side of the street, I'm getting started on the first building, which is going to be the Bradbury building from the film. Uh, with the skewed perspective here, we're going to see the top of this building, as well as the distorted view of its height. So I began by blocking off the first four columns of tiles just for the roof, and then the remaining two will be for that front face of the building. I've got some reference images here from the film, and just like with the character sprite, I'm using silhouettes and line work to kind of plan out a bunch of these objects decorating this space. There's of course limited space to do this, so I decided to just pick out a few details from these screenshots and kind of sneak them in where I could uh, to give some overall representation of what this roof looks like. I mostly worked in a freeform way at this point, uh, relying less on the 8x8 grid to plan objects and more just trying to fit what I could within the allotted space. And you know, just having fun with a few notable items like those metal bars that Deckard hangs onto. Again, I'm not sure this is where they'd exactly appear, uh, but within the bounds of a single screenshot, it's fun to kind of drop these little recognizable or Easter egg type items where you can. For now, the coloring on the rooftop follows the same palette as that used for the sidewalk. Although eventually I shifted the base tone into a stronger blue, kind of blue gray, um, just so that it was visually distinct from the sidewalk below. To reinforce that top-down shading, I've colored the top face outlines of most objects in a lighter outline color than what's used along the front face of them. And with so many metallic items here, I've also focused on using the light tones to draw attention to the tops and front edges, while using the dark tones to create additional depth and texture. And just like with the sidewalk, I finished out the weathering with a bunch of broad patches in various grays and blues, and even brought in an extra shade of green to kind of help out with a bit of wet or mossy look on a lot of these surfaces. Now for the front face of the building itself, this is a bit of an optical trick. To convey the height, I'm creating an angled line composed of equal segments that are five pixels tall. And I chose that because it's a good angle for this purpose, but also because holding shift to move a layer in Photoshop will nudge it by 10 pixels exactly. So that becomes an easy multiple to copy and paste out while nudging. After getting a few of those lines in place, I created some going the opposite way along the width of the building, which generates a sort of grid that will help me place down a few windows. I mean, this is all occurring within a width of 16 pixels on the canvas, so there's not an incredible amount of detail that can be translated here, but building things along the grid lines here just kind of helps reinforce the effect that we're trying to go for. To color this side of the building, I pulled in those blue tones to tie in with that found up top. And I'm doing a similar approach with a slight amount of highlighting just to give a suggestion of depth on some of those edges. Also, I think anywhere that you can show off that angle of the verticality is probably a good thing in order to sell this effect. And here's where things get a bit tricky, uh, because the Bradbury building in Blade Runner has these unmistakable pillars out front with an awning above the entrance. Not only are they an intricate design to translate, but it also means that we've got an object that's going to bridge together the purely top-down street level construction with the weird skewed verticality of the building height. What I decided to do was focus on making the pillar as it may appear at the street level, since that's really going to be the point of reference and recognizability for something like this. 
After getting the pillar silhouette into place, I've roughed out the spiraling design in a mid-tone color. And then from there, I go in between those lines to apply some shading and start to create a bit of depth and rounding. For the awning, I just kind of carried the perspective of the pillar up and kind of slapped on this flat block. And the whole thing together with the side of the building looks a little bit goofy if you stare at it too long. Uh, well, actually, especially the way that the pillar takes up an entire sidewalk, uh, but eventually I bumped out the sidewalk another tile just to kind of alleviate that slightly. In terms of being something that's caught between two different constructions, though, I think it at least serves the purpose of being recognizable for what it is uh, without totally breaking the way things look at street level. All right, hopping back over to the other side of the street, uh, you can see I've gotten started working on some neon lights up there. And there were a few different looks I tried to explore for the glow and lighting in this piece. For the parking meters here, I've surrounded those red and green lights in their respective colors. And then I'm testing out different layer blending modes to have those outlines kind of sit as a bit of transparency, uh, but also interact with what they cover. I found that the screen blending mode uh, tended to work well in most cases for laying in a bright colored glow. And I'd kind of back off the opacity as well to help with that. Normally I don't dip into things like blurring and various blending effects when it comes to glow looks. But in this case, once I got going, I started to see how it would be a fun look to explore how various color overlays could interact with each other and perhaps bring another dimension to this piece. There's a lot of cool lighting techniques that are done now in kind of modern interpretations of pixel art. So I had fun exploring more of that glow overlay look this time around to pop these neon elements in a few other additions. And from that neon, we hop over to Leon, Kowalski that is. <laughs> I of course wanted to have some kind of enemy appearing in the screenshot. I'd consider doing a few generic replicants, uh, because you can imagine that if this were an arcade game, they'd probably have a lot of thugs to get through prior to a boss fight. But I chose Leon mostly because of the street scene. Uh, he'd probably be a fitting boss fight prior to a level inside the Bradbury building. I also really enjoyed Brian James' performance as Leon. Uh, his mannerisms and delivery just really felt like this android bean that was going off the rails, you know? So again here, I'm working off a silhouette, and in fact, if you caught it, this actually started as a mirrored version of Deckard Sprite Silhouette. And then I'm just going through to try and find places to break up a mostly dark costume into something readable. I got distracted kind of struggling with the shading on this one for a while. And I think it's because I was trying to stick with my existing color palette, uh, you know, since it had grown to quite a selection at this point. So I figured there must be something in there that would work for the color in here. But eventually I wiped some of that away and I just chose a few more unique colors and I think it really helped to have the sprite pop against the already dark coloring of the road. Uh, one of the final additions here, and actually there's gonna be some more, but I'll share those kind of after the final artwork reveal. Uh, but for now, I'm adding some rain across the entire canvas. And it's built from these 45 degree lines of pixels, which I've copied out to fill the space. And then if we change the layer blending mode to dissolve and reduce the opacity, It'll actually do kind of a hard omit of a percentage of pixels based on that opacity percentage, uh, leaving us with this randomized broken line of pixels. I like this because it's a bit more of an organic look than perhaps if you were to copy and paste the same raindrop across the entire canvas. Um, of course, I do have the benefit of this being a standalone image to explore that with, though. All right, let's jump ahead and take a look at the final artwork, and I'll come back to discuss another edition after that. So here's a screenshot of Blade Runner as an arcade game. All right, first of all, big thanks to my buddy Tyler for letting me use his track during the reveal there. He's been playing with some Bitcrusher sounds lately, and I've left some links if you want to check out more of his work. As for the artwork, you can see that a good deal of layering has been added in the final image, and a lot of this effect is coming from those screen mode layers like I was talking about earlier. Um, like with the smog here, I've painted in some shapes mostly by hand, and kind of uh, just using like large circles with a few embellishments. And I've positioned those around gaps in the existing composition. Similarly, there are these softer applications of colored patches to give more glow and hue in certain areas. And for now, I'll just bump those up to kind of show you where they are. 
Once the opacities of these elements are tuned to a good level, the effect is subtle enough that it's not drawing the bulk of your attention. But if you were to take it away, all of a sudden you can kind of really see what they were contributing to the atmosphere. All right, let's of course close out with some CRT time. Uh, this is one of the most suiting pieces to see up on that display, I think. So uh, thank you for watching and take care and keep it square.